Well, even though without snow, Christmas is coming, I assure you. You guys probably know, been busy getting ready. When I think about Christmas, uh, I think about times when I was a child, uh, and, and specifically certain Christmases that, that are fond in my memory. And I remember one uh, specific Christmas, I was living in Kansas, um, and I was in ele- elementary school, and a blizzard had hit, and we were kind of snowed in, which is always fun when you're a kid especially, and I guess when you're an adult too, and you can get out of work or something, but... This blizzard was so bad that the snow drifts were, were actually went over our fences, and we had a Siberian husky that if he could get out of the yard, you would never see him again. And so we couldn't even let him out of the house because he could just walk over the fences. That's how bad the snow was. And that same Christmas, uh, I remember I got a beanbag chair for my mom and dad, which was really awesome. My sister had a chair, too. It wasn't a beanbag chair, though. It was, it was a different kind of chair. Uh, but what we would do is we would, we would pull our uh, chairs up to the wood-burning fireplace, and we'd have, I'd have my stuffed dog, and we'd have blankets and stuff and hot cocoa, and we'd put our feet up by the fire, uh, and we'd watch Christmas specials. And in my mind as a kid, that was like the epitome of comfort, just being in mom and dad's house, snowed in. Maybe you guys have memories that are similar to that. Well, as we look at Isaiah 40 this morning, uh, I've got really good news. God is promising comfort to you. So put on your sweatpants, get a warm blanket, a cup of cocoa, nestle up next to the fire in your beanbag chair. Um, I think as we study this, the comfort in, in the first two words of the passage are comfort, comfort. What we're going to find out is that the comfort that God is promising to his people has nothing to do with being comfortable. We know that specifically because of the context where, where Israel is, is in exile in Babylon, and, and they're not feeling very comfortable. And if anything, because of their circumstances, they find themselves doubting God. With that, let's pray. Uh, let's invite God to speak to our hearts this morning through his word and through his Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that we can be here to sing, uh, and we sing these Christmas songs um, uh, looking back at how you fulfilled your promises that, that Isaiah the prophet and, uh, and, and other scriptures spoke about, that you were going to bring about a king for yourself, to set up an eternal kingdom, that anybody who would believe and put their faith in him, that they would be a part of your sheep, of your flock, and that, God, that you, you would care for us and you would comfort us because you are all-powerful. All and that you work even, even in difficult circumstances for our good if we love you. So we pray, God, that as, as we come to your word, that you would speak so powerfully to us. That you would make our hearts ready to receive your words. Um, that your Holy Spirit would be ministering to us and, and opening us to the things that you have for us. That we would love you more. That we would uh, bow before Christ our King in joy and in comfort. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. I think we need some context here, because why do the people need comfort? Chapters 1 through 39 of the book of Isaiah The prophet primarily declares a message to the people of Israel about future judgment. In Isaiah 1 and 2, we we actually find out right away why this message of judgment is so prolific through 39 chapters. And it says in Isaiah 1 2, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children have I reared up and brought up, but they rebelled against me. So at the time of Isaiah... Israel, was, or, or Jerusalem rather, was full of wickedness, idolatry, and injustice. And then Isaiah in chapter 1 c- continues to describe the depravity and the wickedness and the sinfulness of these people. He says this, A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And then he starts to use this imagery of a sickness 
to describe the people. And he says, the whole head is sick. The heart is faint. From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But bruises and sores and raw wounds, they are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. As I read this, I kind of started to think, this sounds familiar. It's kind of like in Genesis, before the flood, the way God looked down at, at, at the wickedness of man and he saw it. And he said it was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And in some ways, it's even more treacherous in this situation because here we're talking about the chosen people of God. The heirs of the promise of Abraham. They were outright denying their holy calling. As a chosen people, they despised God and his ways. And they were totally content to just revel in their sickness and their sin. Now we look at that and we're like, man, these are some bad people. These, these people are terrible. How could they be so evil? But let's not forget that it's in our nature. Since the fall... It is the nature of man to despise God and to delight in sin and spiritual sickness. Think about this. The respected good people, maybe, maybe, maybe let's, let's point to the public, uh, uh, some, some of the, the people in the public that have, have been exposed for their evil. You think of people like Bill Cosby or Matt Lauer. I mean, Matt Lauer did the Thanksgiving parade almost as long as I was alive. I, a lot of people respected him and looked up to him, thought he was a good person. If it's not obvious by that, I mean, look at the people in Scripture who are heralded as heroes of the faith. Noah, just after being delivered from the most devastating, horrific tragedy that the, that the world has seen in the flood, gets drunk on wine. You got Abraham, who lied and gave his wife away to save his own butt twice. You have David, who saw a pretty woman, took him to be her, his own, and then set up a situation to uh, kill her husband, to cover it up. And, and Scripture talks about these guys in the New Testament as heroes of the faith. So even the very best were full of wickedness. They still possess an insatiable hunger to do what is wrong, in the eyes of God. And every time something happens and somebody gets exposed for, for doing something really evil, we're surprised. Isn't that interesting? Like, like somehow it wasn't in their nature to do what they were doing. And I think far be it from us to point to those people and say, shame on you and forget that we are capable of the very same things. It's in us. It's a sickness a sickness that honestly needs to be purged from us. If only God would do an act, a, a miracle on our behalf to make that happen. Jesus is the only person in the history of the world who walked this earth completely despising sin and totally delighting in God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him Jesus who had no what? sin. Hebrews 4 says, we have a high priest in Jesus who was tempted in every point like we are yet without sin. So the people in Isaiah's day were no different than you or me. And their sin forced God's hand to act in judgment. But this judgment was for their sake. God judged them to purge their sin to expose it, to force, to force them to realize how they had turned against him in hopes that they would repent and turn back to him again. These chapters anticipated the capture of Jerusalem, which we know in, uh, based on historical context uh, that that happened by both the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But the first 39 chapters of Isaiah are not only judgment. They're also riddled with hope. Early chapters talk about how God would cut down Israel, but there would be left 
remaining a seed, a holy seed. That God was going to establish a new kingdom, a better kingdom, which would be led by God, where there would be no more suffering and death. And this brings us to chapter 40. Contextually, when we get to chapter 40, there's a huge shift in time, because it goes from, in chapter 39, looking forward to the judgment, now chapter 40 starts at the end of the judgment. So they're in Babylon, towards the end of the exile, and it's in this introduction to this new section, the focus is no longer judgment, but it's consolation of the people. God makes a promise to comfort them. And why do they need comfort even now? Verse 40, cha- or chapter 40, verse 27 gives us some insight into that. It says that the people were disheartened. Their circumstances had caused them to lose faith in God. And they say in verse 27, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by God. They start accusing God, saying, You've, you've abandoned us. How could you do this to your people, God? They have a pity party. And instead of recognizing how they've despised God and repenting, their response is accusations. God, you're distant. God, you've disregarded your promise. God, you're unloving. They're like children who, in discipline by their parents, slam their bedroom door shut and say, I hate you. My mom and dad are here today. (laughs) If you asked them, they'd say, hey, Ryan, that was you. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to get into the details of what was going on there. but That hits home with a lot of us, though, I think. I mean, we, we've all been in situations like that. And, and again, we easily identify with the people of Israel. When our difficult circumstances come into our lives, which are inevitable, how do we respond? We get angry. We get frustrated. We think, God, I go to church. I read my Bible. Maybe, I mean, you probably don't even do that if we're honest. But, but I'm doing my best, God, to just be a good Christian. So why in the world are you letting these bad things happen to me? How could you let me lose my job? How could you let, let me find my, find my marriage in such a terrible position that I'm thinking about divorce? How could you take my kids from me? God, have you forgotten what you said? Have you forgotten your promise? God, you've abandoned me. God, you don't care. God, you're distant. God, you're unloving. We should read these words in the book of Isaiah and recognize that God is making his case, not just before Israel, but before all people, based on who he is and what he has promised, that there has never in the history of the world been a lapse in his faithfulness. That in fact, if we read these words and we recognize who who God is, Israel doesn't have a case against God. We don't have a case against God. Because because of who he is, because of his promises, because uh, of his nature, that it would be impossible for there to be a lapse in his faithfulness. We see this in even the way that he talks to Israel. In the first two verses, God shows his desire to care and to comfort them. He uses really personal language. He says to the prophet, comfort who? My people. Says your God. This relationship apparently hasn't been totally decimated by the sinfulness of the people, but God is still pursuing after them. I think about my daughter. She's going on 19 months old. She does things all the time that I tell her not to do. And I, and I told her like five seconds ago not to do it. And then she does it. Like our Christmas tree, we're learning. I've got a funny video. If you want to see it, I'll show it to you sometime. I got a video because I was sitting downstairs one day, and then I heard some like Christmas bell type of jingling in the front room where our Christmas tree is. Now, I've told her over and over again, don't touch the Christmas tree. I mean, she can even touch it. We've, we've gotten lax on our rules. You can touch it. Just don't pull things off. Don't shake the tree. Don't hit the tree. But I hear, this, I hear this rustling in the front room, so I pulled out my camera because I knew what was going on, and I videotaped it, and, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to say her name, and she's going to know she was caught. So I walk in the room, and she's chinka 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 just having a ball, loving it. Doing the very thing I told her not to do, 
And I say, Alina. And she's like, and then she slinks her way around the tree. Like, like she wasn't doing anything. And we had a little, conver- we had a little conversation after that. Um, I don't know how much she understood, but I don't think not, <laughs> she didn't understand much because she went back and did it like five minutes later anyway. But here's the deal. When I think about how God pursues after Israel and I think about my daughter, it doesn't matter how many times she disobeys me. It doesn't matter how far she runs from me. It doesn't matter even as she grows to be an adult, if she makes wrong choices, if she walks away from her faith, if she, if she goes to prison, I don't know, who knows? There's nothing she could do that will change my affections for her. My love for her would never change from how I feel about her right now. That's how God feels about Israel. That's how God feels about every single person that he has made, every single person in this room. Can you see the merciful nature of God? How can we accuse a God like that of forgetting about us? He says their warfare has ended, their iniquity is part, and their punishment is over. They received double. They, re- they received captivity by the Assyrians and the Babylonians because of their sins. And I tell you this, God always does what he says he's going to do. And if he says he's going to judge you, he's going to judge you. He was faithful in that. He said, Israel, you sinned against me. I'm going to judge you. But you know what? There's going to be hope amidst that judgment. And surely if God was faithful to Israel in dealing the punishment that they deserved, he would be increasingly more faithful in providing them comfort and hope. And here is where their comfort and hope lies, that God himself would come to them. That's what we see in verses 3 through 5. Let's look. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of who? The Lord makes straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now I told you guys my mom and dad are here. They got here on Saturday. In anticipation for their arrival, what do you think we did around our house? We prepared. Cleaned the toilets, swept the floor, did the dishes. You know why? Because my parents are important to me, and I want our house to be a place that they want to come to. When you guys, I'm sure many of you guys, probably this, I don't know, you maybe have, have fa- family in town that came into town, you prepared, didn't you? Yeah? Or you're going to prepare because you're going to have that Christmas party or have some other people come? Because why? Because we respect these people, we love these people, and we want to be a place that they want to come to. Here's Isaiah's message. The Lord is coming, and preparation is necessary. The implication here is that the people need to be prepared for his coming. This text, as we know, is referenced in the Gospels, and I want to look at Matthew chapter 3. Turn in your Bibles with me. To Matthew chapter 3, it'll also be on on the screen. We're going to see and and be able to understand a little bit more how, uh, when this this text was fulfilled in John the Baptist, how this preparation was taking place and is supposed to take place. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1 through 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. This is what he came to preach. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah where he said, when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And then if you jump down a couple of verses to verse 6, we see the, the way the people responded. And they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, doing what? Confessing their sins. So the preparation described in Isaiah revolves around the people repenting and confessing their sins. In preparation for the coming Lord, we don't need to clean up our houses, but it is our hearts that need to be cleaned. We 
you think about it, it's Christmas time. I'm going to keep using Christmas images. Decorating our houses. We've got some beautiful houses in our neighborhood. And, th- and they put beautiful lights up. How many of you guys decorate your houses for Christmas? Anybody? Trees and whatever, maybe inside, outside. We decorate the outside of our houses, but I would make the case that we, as Christians, like to put Christmas lights on our, on our Christianity. Right? We like to dec- decorate ourselves and look really beautiful to other people. We love to be perceived as, as good, faithful Christians, don't we? The problem is Jesus isn't concerned with your outside. I mean, Lord does not care how pretty your Christmas lights are. He cares about the condition of your heart. There were some other people at the baptisms uh, when John the Baptist was baptizing called the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had very pretty Christmas lights on the outside. They came to John the Baptist and they presumed that they were righteous because they were sons of Abraham. And what did John say to them? He said, you brood of vipers. He saw right through the exterior. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Isaiah says, Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. How is this happening? When the glory of the Lord is revealed, all who think highly of themselves, think they're pretty good-looking on the outside, will be brought low. But those who understand their sin and failure before God and repent like the valleys will be raised up. Because the coming of the Lord levels the playing field. Before him and his righteousness, we have nothing to claim. When we are before the king of kings, not one person can stand on their own righteousness or their own good works. If we're prideful like the Pharisees, which I would argue most of us are, including myself, this is a tremendous threat to our egos. The Lord is coming. His glory shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. When people are before the glory of the Lord, two things happen, depending on the posture of their hearts. The prideful are cut down, and the humble who confess and repent are raised up. So what is the posture of my heart before the Lord? I think the posture that that Isaiah would desire of the people when the Lord comes is to say, I have sinned, and I am unworthy of the presence of the Lord. My only hope is that God would change me from the inside out by some miraculous work of salvation. And this was the greatest portion of the promise of God's coming. That this prophecy pointed forward to the first advent. What we celebrate here at Christmas, the reason for the season, as people like to say, coming of the Lord, born to a virgin who would bring salvation to the people. John Yates has a quote. I'm going to read to you. I really like it. It's it's an interesting way to think about the way that God has entered the world throughout history. He says this, Before Christ, God had come to earth in a cloud and fire, in miracle and plague, in wind, earthquake, darkness, and light, but that night he came in the form of a baby. His mother rocked him in her arms, and he had nothing. But now, in his glory, he holds us in his arms, and we have everything. For those who are humble enough to receive the Lord, his comfort, or his coming, is a source of great joy and comfort. But there's more to this promise. Let's look at verse 6. A voice says, cry, and I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. 
Isaiah hears a voice from the heavens and it says cry and Isaiah responds and he says, what shall I cry? And God says, tell them who they are and tell them who I am. When I think about grass, I think about my own lawn. My lawn is fickle, indecisive, inconsistent, changeable, erratic, sparse. <laughs> says that's what, that's what we are as people. We are fickle, we're indecisive, inconsistent, we're changeable, we're erratic. He says, God is not. He does not change. His word stands forever. And you can bank on that. And what a hopeful message for for the people of Israel to say, no, God hasn't abandoned you. Everything that he said he would do, he has done and he will do. And we need to hear that too, that his word does not change. But these words, this description of man is also used in the New Testament in James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. It says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Now, James is addressing trials and testing of faith in the lives of believers. And his point is that through trials, a person's faith in God's unchanging nature and in his faithfulness would become steadfast. Anybody in here face trials or difficulties in their life? It's inevitable. We all know this. It's when we face these difficulties that the things we are actually hoping in are exposed. Anyone who puts their faith, both, that's a mix of hope and faith. You guys can write that down. Anyone who puts their hope and faith in early earthly pursuits, James says, will fade away. It's kind of like uh, Christmas shopping for presents that you, you, you want uh, to work and to... Uh, to, to, to not break or anything like that. So you ask for what? A money-back guarantee, right? A money-back guarantee. I want some sort of ass- insurance, assurance that whatever I'm spending my valued uh, possessions on is going to last. And Isaiah is saying what God says is guaranteed. And you can bank on it. And what God is saying to the people here in chapter 40, is that his king is coming. It's guaranteed. Verse 9. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold the Lord comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. So there's good news. It's said twice here. Good news for all the people. And this good news is to be proclaimed from the mountaintops for all the world to hear. And the question is, okay, who's supposed to proclaim it? And what is the good news? He tells us. O Zion, O Jerusalem, proclaim this good news. In the Old Testament, Zion is the city of David, represents the people of Israel, God's people. In the New Testament, Zion is uh, in reference to the church. So apparently, through Christ, now we've become heralds of this good news. And what is the good news that is to be heralded? Behold, the Lord comes with might. His arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him. His recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. The good news is that the Lord has come, and his reward is salvation in his name. 
We sing Christmas songs. I've had just Christmas songs running through my brain while I was working on this text. Hark the herald, angels sing glory to the newborn king. Are we recognizing this Christmas, and not just at Christmas time, but every single day of the year, the importance and the glory that is the incarnation of our Savior, Jesus? That this baby born of a virgin and given the name Yeshua, which means to deliver, that he ruled everything in existence since before time began, but that he gave up his throne to come and take on flesh. To be born amongst the animals, surrounded by his kinfolk, the shepherds, the lowest of the low. Consider this. If we think about the humble way in which he came, how can we continue in pride? If he lowered himself from creator of the universe to a poor little child born amongst the animals, how much lower are we? Jesus, who was despised and hated by men who suffered and died for our sins, how much more worthy is he of our worship? And this is the glory of Christ, that though he lowered himself, he would not stay lowered. Though he died on a cross, he would not remain there. But God raised him to life again in glory. And at at his ascension, he declared to his disciples and to the whole world that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. And he took his place as king over heaven and earth again. There's a quote I want to read you guys by J.L. Reynolds. It's one of the most powerful quotes I've heard, and it's just stuck with me. And I can't, every time I even open the word, I think about this quote, because it talks about the coronation of God's king. As I read this, I invite you to just worship. When Christ uttered in the judgment hall of Pilate the remarkable words, I am king, he pronounced a sentiment wrought with unspeakable dignity and power. His enemies might deride his pretensions and express their mockery of his claim by presenting him with a crown of thorns, a reed, and a purple robe, and nailing him to the cross. But in the eyes of unfallen intelligences, he was a king. A higher power presided over that derisive ceremony and converted it into a real coronation. That crown of thorns was indeed the diadem of empire. That purple robe was the badge of royalty. That fragile reed was the symbol of unbounded power. And the cross, the throne of dominion which shall never end. And that's why he was born. That's why he lived. Take his throne back so that he wouldn't have a kingdom just to himself, but that he would invite all of us into his kingdom. Jesus is not a distant king. Isaiah describes him as a shepherd, one who loves and looks after his sheep, who gathers them up and holds them closely to his bosom. And it's fitting that at his birth he would be surrounded by shepherds who knew exactly what that meant. And we should find comfort, not today, not just during the Christmas season, but every single day of the year, in the reality that God's king has come. And that if we humbly receive him as our Lord and Savior, that we are his sheep. I think we also have a response in the text, being the church, not to just be really happy that we're sheep, but to go to the mountaintops and to declare this good news to the world around us, that that Jesus' flock would grow, to be heralds of his grace and his salvation to the world. Even as we sing Christmas songs, I thought of this Christmas song, and I'm going to close with this. God rest ye merry gentlemen, Let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ, our Savior, was born on Christmas Day to save us all from Satan's power 
when we were gone astray. O oh, tidings of comfort and joy. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you. And, and, and we don't love you perfectly. We recognize this now. We know that one day we will. But God, the fact that you, your, your affections never change for us, that no matter how far we've gone astray, that you love us and that, and that Satan has covered our sin. And I pray, God, that we would recognize that and have, have the, the ability to let go of our egos and to say, God, I am a sinner, but God, thank you for the salvation you've given me in your son, Jesus, that you sent him for me, that you have given me hope and comfort. And God, that that doesn't mean I'm going to be comfor comfor comfortable in this life, but that I have everlasting comfort and hope in my salvation. God, let us spread this news. Let us be inviting people into our lives so that they would see the living God and the hope that is available to them as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.